Can you imagine the overwhelming joy, humility, gratitude, and love that will consume your soul when Jesus Christ, the merciful Redeemer, speaks to you by name and says, Come unto me, ye blessed. Thank you, President Reese, for such a warm welcome to the university and for your very kind introduction. I want to thank all those who have made this morning so easy for me. And I want to give a special um, uh, statement of gratitude to Melanie Ride and Ethan Brown, who helped provide the visual experience that we hope to share with you today. My dear friends, I'm a little nervous to be with you this morning. Very grateful, but nervous nonetheless. It seems to me like a dream to be here. I was a freshman in 1972, that was 52 years ago. And just as you do, I attended many devotionals in this building. As a young student, neither I nor anyone who knew me, excepting my mom, could ever have imagined that I would stand here one day. <laughs> in my freshman year, President Dallin H. Oaks was in his second year as president of this university. That year, President Oaks taught his first and only Book of Mormon class, or so I've been told by him. And I had the good fortune of being a student in that class. To my great chagrin, as incredible as that experience was to be taught by President Oaks, one memory stands out. One day, at the conclusion of class, President Oaks asked me to stay and visit. My hair was a fair bit longer than the standards allowed. Looking kindly into my face, President Oaks said, Brother Schmutz, <laughs> I can't help noticing that some of your classmates are wondering if the president of the university is going to say anything to you about the length of your hair. I would rather not. Can you take it from here? <laughs> I nodded. And at the next class, I had a new look and a new love for my president. President Oaks continues to encourage and kindly invite better behavior. My youthful inability to imagine standing at this pulpit to deliver a devotional message touches on a theme I want to explore with you this morning. I pray we will have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Lord wishes to tell us. As impressions come, be mindful to follow them. God strengthens us in our efforts, grace for grace. In May 2022, some of you will remember that President Russell M. Nelson spoke to young adults from all over the world at the conference center. The talk is entitled Choices for Eternity. Please study it. It's just for you. President Nelson said on that occasion, there are three major truths that are rarely addressed. First, each of us is going to die. Second, because of Jesus Christ, each of us is going to be resurrected and become immortal. And third, judgment day is ahead for each of us. When we die, as soon as we are departed from this mortal body, whether we be good or evil, we enter the great world of the spirits of the dead, where the spirits of those who are righteous are received into the paradise of God. These will rise in the morning of the first resurrection, and then cometh the judgment. It is only in the resurrected state that we can receive a fullness of joy. The Holy One of Israel will be our judge, and He cannot be deceived. President Nelson gave his reason for sharing these three immutable but seldom discussed truths with the young adults of the Church. He said, My purpose tonight is to make sure that your eyes are wide open to the truth that this life really is the time when you get to decide what kind of life you want to live forever. Now is your time to prepare to meet God." End quote. Note that this right to choose comes with conditions. We do not draw out a lucky number and get to pick our kingdom like the prize behind the curtain of a game show. 
We must abide by the required laws and conditions. Our kingdom choosing is tied to our commandment keeping. So my purpose this morning is to help you understand true doctrine and establish practices in your lives that, if followed, will improve your ability to imagine meeting God and receiving the kingdom of glory He has prepared for you. When we exercise faith to believe in such a kingdom, diligently learn all we can about it, and imagine our own place in that kingdom, we will more effectively pursue it with faith and fervor through the days of our lives. I echo some of the feelings of President Reese in saying that we love you. We really, truly want you to find peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. And we're grateful for your faithfulness. We are astonished at the strength of this generation of Latter-day Saints. You are not like the rest of the world. But a word of caution. When you are in the bloom and vibrancy of young adulthood, death can seem too far off to think about. It is easy to observe in the world around us that most people have little concern with death, resurrection, and judgment, and therefore little concern for connecting the way we live in this life to the reward we will receive in the next. However, that connection is absolute and unavoidable. God expects us to be intentional with our mortality. Remember, to be spiritually minded is life eternal. A few years ago, my wife and I enjoyed a heartwarming little film entitled, I Can Only Imagine. The story is sweet, it's wholesome and inspiring. Some of you may have seen that film. The movie was inspired by the life of a young man who wrote a beautiful song of joy by the same name I can only imagine, anticipating a moment when he would be with Jesus at the end of his life. We could discuss small differences in our doctrinal understanding of that beautiful day when we are brought into the presence of Jesus Christ, but we certainly share the feelings of joyful anticipation and imagining displayed in the lyrics and music of that song. But this is not the first time we have been asked to imagine that culminating moment, is it? In Alma chapter 5, the prophet gave a timeless sermon filled with inspired questions. Many of them are worthy of your deepest consideration and self-evaluation. But this morning, I want to focus on two of Alma's questions, which invite us to imagine. So please be like Nephi. Like in these scriptures to yourselves, imagining you were there in the audience, listening intently to the great prophet Alma. Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in the mortal body? Isn't that a supremely consequential question? If you really ponder, it'll stop you in your tracks. To look forward to an event suggests a happy anticipation of what is to come. To look forward with an eye of faith in the things God has revealed is choosing to believe with such intensity that we will do whatever is required to receive or achieve it. I am reminded of President Nelson's counsel, quote, when you reach up for the Lord's power in your life with the same intensity that a drowning person has when gasping for air, power from Jesus Christ will be yours, end quote. President Nelson is asking us to imagine, isn't he? Similarly, if we believe with the same intensity in the promise that Jesus has prepared a house for us among the mansions of our Father, we will more earnestly attend to the day-to-day business of righteousness. I promise we will be supported in our efforts, for faith as a principle of power is a gift from God which follows our righteous actions. Many here are returned missionaries and know the power of asking inspired questions. Inspired questions invite personal engagement and productive self-evaluation. Inspired questions invite the Holy Ghost into the heart of the hearer. 
inspired questions prepare people to act on the invitations given them. With that in mind, listen to Alma's next inspired question. Can you imagine to yourselves that ye hear the voice of the Lord saying unto you in that day, Come unto me, ye blessed, for behold, your works have been the works of righteousness upon the face of the earth. Can you imagine the overwhelming joy, humility, gratitude, and love that will consume your soul when Jesus Christ, the merciful Redeemer, speaks to you by name and says, Come unto me, ye blessed. This, brothers and sisters, will be the ultimate, transcendent, incomparable moment of inclusion and belonging. But don't be deceived by the voices of the world. That ultimate celestial belonging is not freely given to all of God's children. It is freely offered. But the gift of eternal life is reserved for those who accept the offer by keeping, keeping covenants made in the house of the Lord. The story of Jesus appearing to the more righteous Nephites after his resurrection evokes a kind of visual experience, at least for me, akin to what this ultimate meeting with Jesus may be like. Quote, and they did all, both they who had been healed and they who were whole, bow down at his feet and did worship him and did kiss his feet insomuch that they did bathe his feet with their tears, end quote. Can you imagine our ability to visualize God's reward for the faithful will diminish or increase in direct proportion to our obedience and covenant keeping and our willingness to keep Jesus Christ at the center of our lives. I am confident that Alma intended his questions to awaken in his hearers a personal response a need for self-evaluation, a consuming commitment to learn and do everything necessary to experience that moment. Have they awakened such feelings in you? Don't be discouraged. Take heart. Please do not negatively compare where you are today with where others may be in their lives. Even the senior leaders of the church, as well as prophets in ancient days, were refined by their struggles and mistakes because they persisted with faith in Christ. Progress is pleasing to the Lord. So look to our prophets and apostles, for example, in counsel. Look to the women and men who have been called to lead the church. No matter the current condition of our spiritual lives, Jesus invites us to come unto him in faith, repent, receive the ordinances of the priesthood and the companionship of the Holy Ghost, and covenant to continue in his way. This is the doctrine of Christ. Repentance with faith in Christ opens windows of opportunity in our lives through which the Lord pours out his blessings. Some years ago, in my earliest days as a general authority, I was given an opportunity to accompany and observe President M. Russell Ballard as he officiated at a ceiling in the Salt Lake Temple. President Ballard had known the groom's family. The couple being sealed appeared to be in their, in their late 30s, and one or both of them had been previously married. Before we went into the ceiling room, President Ballard told me not to expect many words from him saying, it is hard to offer more truth or eloquence than the words of the ordinance themselves. During the sealing, President Ballard shared one scripture, a single scripture, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As President Ballard recited this scripture and said just a word or two about it, the groom became vis visibly emotional. Tears began to run down his cheeks. Following the ceiling, as the company began to reverently express their love to this couple and file out of the ceiling room, a man quietly came to me and informed me he was the groom's best friend. In a whisper, he asked if I had noticed that the, groom's, um, the groom had become emotional. As I nodded, the man continued, Will you please let President Ballard know that for reasons I don't have time to tell you, 
the scripture he recited has been instrumental in the groom's long and difficult return to faith and worthiness to be in the temple today. To hear President Ballard quote that scripture, he said, was a confirmation from heaven that God is pleased with him. As President Ballard and I walked from the ceiling room, I told him of this conversation. He stopped, thought for just a moment, and smiling softly said, I had not planned to use that scripture. Now I know why it came to me. Each of us is in our own season of life. Individual experiences within the Lord's plan for His children can be very different from child to child, but His plan of happiness will always be grounded on the invitation to come to Christ, repent, and partake of His Atonement through making covenants with Him. So let's discuss some personal habits and practices you might more intentionally incorporate into your lives as you prepare for a joyful return to your heavenly home. First, make time to be in the house of the Lord. I'm guessing that most of you here have been endowed in the temple. I'm grateful for all who are here, and I speak to all. If you have not yet been endowed, I invite you to prepare. Start wherever you are. Include the bishop or even the missionaries in your preparations if you are not a member of the church. The experience in the house of the Lord is very personal. In the house of the Lord, we imagine hearing the voice of God inviting us to receive our inheritance in His kingdom. In the house of the Lord, we are taught the plan of salvation and the essential role of Jesus Christ in the plan. Our minds are turned back to the creation. We learn of the necessity of the fall of Adam and Eve and the need for the Atonement of Christ. We are pointed forward to the glorious end and eternal destiny God has prepared for us. We are shown what is required of us in mortality, in the here and now, to qualify the gift for the gift of eternal life. And we are invited to covenant that we will do what is required. President Howard W. Hunter once shared the amazement he experienced from learning in the house of the Lord and imagining where he fit in the plan. Quote, the mighty perspective of eternity is unraveled before us in the holy temples. We see time from its infinite beginning to its endless end, and the drama of eternal life is unfolded before us. Then I see more clearly my place amidst things of the universe, my place among the purposes of God, and I am better able to place myself where I belong." End quote. Learning in the house of the Lord helps us imagine meeting God. If you desire to more effectively place yourself where you belong, visit the house of the Lord frequently enough to allow the Lord to put His law in your mind and write it in your broken heart. For all kingdoms have a law given, and you must know the law of the kingdom of your choosing, or you cannot abide in it. A willingness to keep sacred covenants with God made in the house of the Lord continues a process of inviting God's power into our lives. Access to the power of God includes the spirit of revelation and the ability to see what is not seen. This enhances our ability to heed President Nelson's invitation to think celestial. It is thrilling, absolutely thrilling, to see the number of young adults who serve in the house of the Lord. We hope you will attend as often as you can. Through repetition, eternal truths are taught in the house of the Lord, which become embedded in our spiritual minds. It may be said that doctrine learned in the temple awakens our spiritual minds to things learned before coming to this earth, including the mysteries not understood by the natural mind. The more frequently we attend, the more earnestly we participate, the more revelatory the experience becomes. Second, take your experience in the house of the Lord home with you. In the house of the Lord, true doctrine and eternal principles are taught through sacred symbols. When we leave, we are privileged to carry a symbol of the temple with us. It is the garment of the holy priesthood, 
which we are given at the time of our endowment. The garment is a symbolic reminder that it is only in and through Jesus Christ and because of his atoning sacrifice that we can ever regain the presence of the Father. Don't miss the eternal significance of that statement. Only those who make covenants in the house of the Lord and faithfully keep them will be able to behold the loving face and brilliant countenance of God the Father throughout eternity. President Russell M. Nelson has said, quote, Your garment is symbolic of the veil of the temple, and the veil is symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you put on your garment, you may feel that you are truly putting upon yourself the very sacred symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, and his mission, which was to atone for every daughter and son of God." End quote. So receive the garment with joy and wear it with reverence. Satan delights when a child of the covenant disregards the sacred symbolism of the garment. If you are looking for the times and activities when you can justify removing the garment, rather than looking for ways to keep it on, you risk setting at naught the symbolic purpose and meaning of the garment. The temple recommend should also be a constant reminder of an inner commitment to keep every covenant that you have made. It is a symbol of belonging. If we are faithful to our covenants, it is a reminder that we honorably hold a name and standing in the house of the Lord to all generations and for eternity. A current temple recommend worthily held helps us feel connected to an eternal family and the joy of that belonging. For the same sociality which exists among us here exists, will exist among us there, only it will be coupled with glory. Our temple recommend is a tangible symbol of personal worthiness and of our desire to be in the house of the Lord. So please never let a day go by that it is not current. Never let a day go by that you are not worthy of it. But if you transgress, we pray that you will speedily repent and return. Think of the temple recommend as a certificate of entitlement to the power and blessings sought earnestly by Joseph Smith in his prayer at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Quote, and we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, and that thy name may be upon them, and thy glory round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. End quote. Imagine this power actually flowing through your lives. A third way to take our experience in the house of the Lord home with us is to regularly remind ourselves of the covenants we have made in the name of Jesus Christ. In October 2021, President Nelson extended the following invitation, quote, I invite you to set a regular time to rehearse in your mind the covenants you have made, end quote. This morning, I invite you to make this a daily practice after receiving this counsel from President Nelson, I began taking time in my morning prayers to consider the symbol of the garment I wear and to rehearse in my mind the covenants I have made in the house of the Lord. I review each carefully. I evaluate my station, my progress in the keeping of each covenant. I renew my commitment to keep each covenant by promising Heavenly Father that I'll give my very best I ask for His grace to make up for my shortcomings. This has brought about many sacred spiritual experiences in my life. I invite you to take time for the house of the Lord, attend often, and intentionally take your experience home with you through symbols and reminders. Third, look for the city of the living God. God invites us to fix our sights on the promises and rewards of righteousness. He knows that when we intentionally, intentionally visualize the rewards that await the faithful in heavenly places and actively adopt habits which help us imagine that eternal reward as our own destination, the difficulties and temptations of this life lose their influence. God knows that we cannot imagine a celestial home that we have not seen or about which we have not heard. 
in the scriptures, we can study for ourselves the descriptions of the glory that God has prepared for his faithful children because he has shown them to prophets who have eyes to see. Knowledge of the celestial city of God is motivating. It will enhance your capacity to imagine with an eye of faith. Consider Abraham and Sarah for a moment. By faith, Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah received strength to conceive seed when she was long past the age of her fertility because she judged him faithful who had promised. And what were the promises? Sarah referred to the promises of God given to Abraham and Sarah equally that God had prepared a celestial city for their eternal habitation and that their posterity would be as numerous as the stars of the sky or the sand which is by the seashore. Abraham and Sarah died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. When the promised rewards of the next life become so real in our minds that they motivate our every action in this life, then we are drawing near to our eternal home. If you can imagine the city of the living God, can you imagine the kind of people that inhabit it? They dwell in the presence of God and Jesus Christ forever and ever. They are surrounded by a numberless con company of angels. They belong to the Church of Enoch and to the Church of the Firstborn. Their names are written in heaven. They are citizens of that city with all the rights and privileges that would entail. They become heirs and rulers in the kingdom of God. They are just men and women who have been made perfect through the perfect atonement of Jesus Christ by the shedding of his own blood. Can you imagine being one of them? Oh, my heart cries, let this be me. I invite you to enter the house of the Lord. Make and keep the sacred covenants offered by the, by the ordinances of the holy priesthood. Return often. Take the experience home with you in symbol and intentional reminders. Fix your heart and mind on the eternal promises of God and be persuaded of them. Embrace them and imagine your place of belonging in the eternal home of the Father and the Son. I witness the truth and very existence of God the Father and His glorious Son, Jesus Christ. They live. I testify of the actual reality of a coming day of joy and gladness for the faithful who hear the voice of the Lord speaking to them, Come unto me, ye blessed. May you be blessed to imagine and experience that moment in your eternal lives, I so pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.